Uh, without a bank account, it's hard to save your money. Uh, but not only that, you have to pay fees just on check cashers, uh, prepaid debit cards, money orders, remittance, just to use your money. You're paying 10% of your income. And these are financial uh, transactions that those of us with bank accounts don't pay anything for. Um, but banks have long ago abandoned these rural neighborhoods and low-income neighborhoods. Then there's a the problem of credit. Nearly half of the US population doesn't have access to $500. In the event of an emergency, they would have to borrow. So where can they go? Um, if something goes wrong, your kid gets sick, your car breaks down, you have to miss work, the government shuts down. Um, where do you go when you miss a paycheck? You have to go to a payday lender, a title loan. And these um, modern day loan sharks charge about 300 to 2,000% APR. Um, even with a bank account, these, uh, there, there are no banks that, that uh, allow you know, small loans anymore. Um, so whose fault is this? Sometimes I hear people say that the problem is financial education. Okay, So you have to convince people not to do this. But this assumes that the poor take out these loans frivolously or that there's another option for them to go to. But there's nowhere for them to turn. Banks don't provide these services. There are friends and family, but that has its own problems, as some of you may, may know. Um, so there's a disparity in banking services today. There's a mainstream, regulated, federally subsidized banking sector that serves the wealthy and the middle class. And there's this wild west hodgepodge of unregulated lenders that serve the low income at very high costs. How did we get here? Um, over the last 30 years, there's been a merger wave in the banking sector. So America used to be dominated by a multitude of community banks that were regulated that way. They were forced to be community banks. And once we deregulated the banks, they all conglomerated such that we have five or six banks that now control 80% of the assets. And when banks merge, they shut down their unprofitable locations. So over the last 10 years, as the merger wave has and second merger wave has swept through the country, 98% of the bank locations that they have closed up have been in low-income neighborhoods. Um, so how do we fix this problem? Every law over the last 30 years, even as community banks have been failing, has focused on community banks as the answer to the problem. It's not working. They're not interested. Uh, so as Ganesh said, um, it's time for public option. There's also some people who put their faith in financial technology or fintech. And look, innovation will help us all have cheaper and easier banking, again. Um, but, but it won't fix the problem because every fintech provider needs a bank account. Banks have a monopoly on the payment system. They are public entities. And so fintech relies on the banking sector through the back door to get, uh, to get you there. And they charge fees. So this is not a solution um, for the unbanked. Also, um, if you're trying to save your money, uh, you need a trusty, uh, trustworthy institution. Um, so while we may uh, like our startups to, to come up with things, when, you know, when it comes to someone holding our money, um, we tend to trust uh, old, sort of dusty institutions like the federal government. Um, so instead of just looking uh, to, for technology, perhaps it's time to look at, at the past. Um, so the United States Post Office uh, was a bank for much of our history. Um, the United States Post Office, I'm gonna give you a quick little tour through um, uh, the, the post office history and postal banking. Um, the post office predates the Constitution, and it is not an overstatement to say that the post office built the foundation of our democracy. When de Tocqueville comes to study our democracy, he talks about the post office um, being a pivotal point because, um, being a pivotal way of, I'm sorry, Okay, <laughs> this is the Postal Act of 1792, written by the Founding Fathers, made three crucial de decisions, and it seems like one of them is up. One is that the post office would be financially supported by the Treasury. It would be self-sustaining, but not profitable, okay? Two, that the post office would serve every community without regards to profits, and it still does. And three, the Congress would subsidize the dissemination of newspapers by the post office. Why newspapers? Because the democracy is um, healthy when everyone knows what's going on. And so when de Tocqueville is in Michigan and seeing these loggers that know just as much about what's happening in DC than those who live in DC, he's saying this is because of the post office. And so Europe takes our model and does the post office there um, to promote democracy. Um, so postal banking in the US was first proposed um, after the Civil War by President Grant's Postmaster General. 
Uh, but as with banking reform of any kind, you need a crisis to get anything done. So it was after the panic of 1907 that Teddy Roosevelt endorsed postal banking right away. Uh, it wasn't until 1910 that we established the United States Postal Savings System with the help of President Taft and his Congress. Immediately, this was a success. By 1913, the Times called it self-sustaining, having received 32 million deposits in the span of three years, mostly from immigrants. They were coming in from Europe that already had postal banking. The post office spoke 24 different languages um, in the postal banking sector. And so um, a lot of immigrants um, took to these accounts. But then as the Great Depression hit and banks were failing left and right, people you found refuge in the post office because it was backed by the treasury. They knew this was a safe place to save their money. So every year in the Great Depression, deposits in the post office doubled each year from 1930 until 1933. Um, after the Great Depression, FDR chose a deposit insurance instead of postal banking, which were the two options he could. So one was a public option. The other was a public insurance fund to support the private banking sector. And Roosevelt chose the latter. Um, but he retooled the post office savings bank to use the funds um, to, to fund the wars. Um, so they sold postal um, defense savings span, uh, stamps at the post office, and some of them are some of them are creepy. These are the less creepy ones. Actually, one of one of these is creepy. Um, but the point is that so so, so he he raised eight billion dollars um, through these postal um, savings uh, stamps. With each change in circumstances, the post office has been allowed to adapt and innovate. They invented the Pony Express. The first pilots were doing airmail for the post office, and then. As troops are being stationed abroad, they innovated bank by mail. And so um, the highest uh, um, postal deposit year was 1947 with 3.4 billion in deposits, over 4 million users, a lot of them soldiers abroad. So by 1950s, what happens to the post office? By 1950s, banks are everywhere. They're offering low interest deposits. And because of heavy state regulation, lots of mandates on interest rates, anyone can get a bank account anywhere. Johnson, Pre President Johnson in 1966 shuts down, persuaded by the banking lobby, shuts down uh, the postal system, says it's no longer necessary. But note that 20 years later, those banks are no longer there. Okay, um, so in many ways today, the banking landscape more resembles 1910 than it did 1966, which was the golden era of community banking. Uh, so what if the new big solution to our problem of financial exclusion is a really old one? Um, postal banking could eliminate banking deserts and leave no American unbanked. People trust the post office still. So while we may think of the post office as a dinosaur, we don't suspect them of being a shark. And this stability and trust is crucial to sound banking. The post office never left low-income neighborhoods. 60% of post office locations are in banking deserts, areas that banks have vacated. And this is important because the unbanked and the underbanked still use cash. And so they need to have a brick and mortar location um, to save their money. Um, this is not to say that they would have to remain in cash. Once you have a savings or checking account, you can use your debit card to start paying your bills. We can end the ridiculous injustice that m the most financially vulnerable have to pay the most just to use their money. More importantly, a savings account can provide a financial buffer for people when times get tough. Imagine again that you need $500 a month just to make it through, except now you can go to the post office, an institution that is not trying to gain maximum profits from your desperation, and perhaps you can get a loan for 10% interest as opposed to 300 to 2,000%. So today in America, the Again, the poor pay more than anyone else just to use their money and for credit services. The less money you have, the more you use to spend to use it. Um, look, reasonable loans and savings are not going to cure poverty, but it will provide a much needed lifeline instead of a crushing burden when people are desperate for small credit. The post office is well suited to do this because it's a trusted government institution. It helped build our country. It was pivotal to our uh, democracy. It still manages to deliver mail to every household in the US daily. It has a branch in every neighborhood and has public service as its central mission. And the post office is struggling to survive as are so many millions of low-income Americans. So postal banking could breathe, breathe life into both, uh, which is what I call a win-win. So that's my idea. Thank you.